yeah, we'll get a video going here. So what you're seeing is the uh, 3D emulate layout of this production line. Uh, it's a new line. It's been in production for roughly four to five months now. Uh, it builds our 100C contractor, as I said. Uh, this line uh, assembles over basically the contractor. It has over 400 SKU variations in it. Uh, the line is operated by six operators and two material handlers um, on one shift per day. It builds over a million, one and a half million contactors a year. The layout of the line is in a horseshoe shape, as you'll see. It is uh, laid out that way such that uh, as the machines and sections are operating, raw goods are brought into the center uh, and fed into the process. And any type of maintenance work that needs to be done is handled on the outside. So helping to streamline the uh, maintenance support process to keep the line running as much as possible. The line is laid out into five zones, uh, three of the zones are assembly zones where the contactors are assembled. One zone is print and testing uh, to print labels onto the contactors and test for functionality. And the fifth zone being where we do packaging uh, into individual cartons or bulk packaging into cases. So we're going to spend some time here is talking about the uh, what the different zones do and the automation that's behind them and why we do some of the things we do in those zones. So starting with the first zone, uh, the first zone is where we do the base assemblies. So these are the bottom half of the contactors. Um, for those 400 variations, we actually start with three different base configurations that support those 400 um, different uh, SKUs. And this zone primarily is, is there to build these bases and provide a queued uh, buffering for the downstream portions that we'll talk about next. Uh, so basically we're operating here to fill a buffer system that orders are executed against uh, downstream. Uh, if you'll notice as the contactors moving through the system, these are traveling on a iTrack based um, independent cart technology. Uh, this allows us to um, track every assembly uh, throughout the entire system. We know where it is at all times. Uh, as they go from station to station and receive their components, um, as it's being assembled, uh, they can be completed and released to the next section, uh, but they aren't required to make it all the way to that next station. So they can do a buffering uh, sort of process in between them. What this allows to is to maximize throughput on the line. Uh, we don't have to index the entire line uh, as one step in a process. Uh, each station can operate completely independent, and if its cycle time goes a little long, it doesn't impact the rest of the line. From there, we travel into zone two. Zone two is where we actually start the order processing uh, step in, in the assembly. So what we do is we now pull uh, the base units as needed uh, to execute on an order. Orders are derived from SAP, uh, transferred into factory dock production center, where specific uh, requirements on the assembly process are then handed off to the automation layer. At this point, uh, we are actually able to execute at quantities of one uh, because of the design of the line. So that initial buffering provides everything we need to make all the different variations of contactors. Uh, most all stations have multiple infeed of raw materials so that depending on what model of the contactor you're making, uh, we pull the necessary components and assemble them onto the traveling uh, movers that uh, travel down the iTrack system. Uh, within the system, you'll see as we go through this, there's an extensive use of robotics, um, an extensive use of vision technology. Uh, the reason for all this is, is it allows us to have flexibility around what the robots can provide us on you know, diversity of assembly requirements. So as I go from one model to another model, I may have to pick up, say, a same component, but place it differently depending on that model or retrieve a different component to go into the model of the contactor. As we do this, we use the vision systems to verify that we're picking things properly, we're placing them properly, and making sure that overall we're getting the quality of, of the assembly that we want to achieve. Uh, should anything fail, uh, because of the iTrack technology, we can bypass those sequence stations and carry the incomplete unit to a uh, reject station where they can be removed, reworked, and returned back into the system uh, for continuation on their assembly process. When we get to zone three, uh, as you'll see here, the iTrack technology has been replaced by Magnamover light technology. Uh, so we still have closed loop capability to track all contactors where they are in the system at all times. Uh, but one of the advantages we gain here is the ability to 
route a contactor out of a system for testing. If should it fail, it can be rerouted to a rework station and routed back into the process to pick up exactly where it was left off. So we get that bi-directional product load through the system. In zone three, what we're also doing is adding the high component, high value components uh, to the process. So in, you can think of zone one was the generic basis that we start with. Zone two is we begin to build up specific model units, but in zone three is where we begin to implement or add the expensive componentry uh, that gives value to the, the product being made. Zone four, which we don't have a video on, um, is where we actually do our testing uh, of the units. So because of proprietary technologies, we can't show the video there, but we can talk about it a little bit. So within zone four, um, every contactor uh, enters a testing process. Uh, within that testing process, we collect over 400 variables around the operation of the contactor, whether it's current throughput on contactors, current draw on coils, uh, travel distances on the mechanical mechanisms, and so on. And from that, we can build up a pass-fail profile around every contactor. Um, as part of this, I didn't mention this earlier, but on zone two, one of the things that we do is we start the serialization process as well, because we are tracking against orders. Every contactor is fully serialized, and as it travels from zone two through zone three and zone four and eventually into packaging, uh, we are able to collect the full assembly genealogy of that contactor. Past zone four, uh, we get into the packaging area. So in packaging here, we're actually performing two different types of functions. Uh, one is, which as you see on the video, is we're actually loading individual uh, contactors into cartons for shipping purposes. Uh, these will be placed in different outfeed lines, as, as you can see the robot doing, uh, in order to be grouped together to go out as part of an order that they've been manufactured against. We also have the ability to pick up contactors with the robot prior to entering the cardening phase and simply take the raw contactors and place them on that same conveyor. So the purpose of that is when we're doing uh, bulk grouping. So whereas a single contactor in, in a carton can be sold, when we have large orders, when we need to ship 20 or 30 or 40 at a time, uh, there's no much point in placing them in individual cartons. We can simply bulk pack them to a case at this point in the process. So as an overall architecture here, um, all of this is a logics-based environment, um, fully integrated, tracking um, with closed loop control of the contactors from start to finish, um, multiple componentry in feed processes for zero changeover so that as long as we have the proper raw goods staged um, as part of the manufacturing process for the day, uh, there are no changeover requirements as we go through the day. So we can literally make a different contactor on every cycle through the process. Uh, so efficiencies are very high because there's no, there's for the most part there's no changeover or downtime associated with the manufacturing process. Once it turns on at the beginning of the day, it in theory should run more or less nonstop for the entire day. In addition to all this, we've done a lot of information integration vertically uh, around capturing data and performance data. Uh, the entire system, um, all of its actuations, um, all of the motions performed through the assembly process. Because we can track every serial number on the contactor, we can track what happened on that station uh, against that contactor. So at the end of the process, a single contactor can have a full genealogy of not just what it was doing at each station, but the mechanical actuations that went into assembling that. So if you think over time as we build out profiles of different models, we should be able to predict, you know, are there trends in the assembly process that are going to lead to quality problems? Um, are there things that we can see that are, are, are directly impacting um, that process that we can make improvements to and so on and so forth. So that vertical integration is very important to what we did here. And that's a very quick synopsis of this line. So questions. So not seeing any questions coming through, but so yesterday we received a number of questions. Um, I'll just re-roll some of those. Um, one of the questions we got was, um, what was the impact to um, this line in terms of trying to drive it to having zero changeover? Uh, this is a production line uh, that we brought into Milwaukee. Um, that's a new line, but it's an old product or an older product. Um, we were reworking another manufacturing location to move some things around and decided to update this line. 
on that previous line where we didn't have the ability to do the seamless changeovers from one model to another, um, we required a, a large number of people to be involved in the process simply from the standpoint in, to expedite that changeover process. So as we would go from one model to another model, uh, a large number of people would have to be involved to get the line converted over. So we went from a line that had over a dozen people uh, supporting its operations on two shifts to six people on one shift and still meeting the same throughput. Uh, another question we got was the around the, the axis count um, across this line. So there are five zones. Um, most of the zones are multi-station zones. Um, they are supported by a number of different robot technologies, whether they're articulated arm, um, scares, deltas, gantries, uh, simple pick and place mechanisms. Uh, and when you factor in the, the Magna Motion product, the iTrack product, uh, there's an excess of about 400 servo axes that make up the entire process. So question was, how were the quality metrics implemented? So uh, great question there. Um, from that standpoint, we actually leveraged a new technology uh, that is just happened. We released it on Friday um, to the public domain a product we call Factory Talk Edge Gateway. Uh, this product is meant to streamline the integration between the automation layer and the information systems above. Um, it does this by collecting the data from the control system and organizing it against a information model that's actually stored at the automation layer so that as the data is collected, it follows more of a transactional process that information systems are akin to using and, and less of a polled time series process that automations have historically uh, leveraged for getting data out of them. Uh, as a result, we can actually build up data models around every station throughout the process. And at the end of a cycle with a single trigger, collect all of that profile information around performance uh, and quality. So on the back end, when we get that to the information layer and we start to run the analytics again, it's, it's much more streamlined than if we were trying to decipher time series historical data to do the same thing. All right, well, I think we're getting close to the end of the session. And since there are no more questions, we are wrapped. Everybody have a good day.